Well, initially I did not know what we were going to do today. Um, I battled and battled and battled, tried to figure it out because I, I wasn't really feeling good. I didn't feel like working on this lesson at all. Uh, so I, I got up this morning to see how I feel. Uh, I had a backup plan, but I didn't have to go to the backup plan because I, I felt good enough to put a lesson together this morning, actually. So it's a little short, that's why. But uh, I think we'll get what get covered what we need to get covered. And that's the first four trumpets. Sometimes they're the best ones. Sometimes they're the best ones, that's right. Um, but next week, like I said, guest teacher will have uh, Rudy teaching you guys. Uh, I don't know what he's got prepared. Uh, probably along the lines of Bible study, about studying your Bible. I'm not sure. That was just one of the suggestions I gave you. But for the next week, uh, read Revelation 9 and 10, because this is at the point where we're really going to start moving forward. And the reason why we're going to move forward at a little bit faster clip is because a lot of this from now on is speculation. And I don't want us to get caught up in speculation. We could sit here and dwell and, and discuss and debate well, this is what it means, and that's what it means. And I'll be honest with you, we will never know what it means until it happens. I honestly believe that those, the generation that is here, post-rapture, will be able to open the Scripture and read it like a standard operating procedure, like a manual. I believe the Holy Spirit will give them supernatural insight to this is what's happening, and this is coming next, and here it is, and it will be a witnessing tool. Those 144,000 will be able to pick up the book of Revelation. They'll be able to pick up the book of Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They'll be able to point that this is coming and here it is. You know, Joel, the, Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 3, Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah 14, 13. All of that will become so evident and clear. But right now, let's be honest, um, God has sealed it. He promises that in Daniel chapter 12. Remember, we've talked about that that the knowledge of the end times is sealed up until the end, and it's sealed up until the time when God unseals it. So we can sit here and speculate about this stuff and pontificate about it, and, you know, I've seen battle lines drawn on prophecy boards, and, and you know, oh, it means this, no, it means that. You don't know. You, you really, hey, brother, good to see you. You really, you really don't know. You have no idea. Uh, and so, in a sense, we're not unlike the Bible students and the Bible teachers of four or five hundred years ago. Uh, when they did not understand certain things about the Scripture. Matter of fact, that those of you who have, have eSword, uh, if you've done your homework and downloaded eSword, if you'll go look at Gill's commentary, Gill was a Baptist theologian who, where did Gill live, 17th, 18th century? He was a Baptist theologian. If you will go look at his commentary on the book of Revelation, you will see that he had a historicist viewpoint. Whereas I don't think you can find one Baptist now that has a historicist viewpoint. Somebody who believes his history or a preterist viewpoint. But he was a very prominent theologian. And he held the preterist slash historicist viewpoint. And you can see that in his commentary. So we will be a lot like those guys until God unseals it. So, first trumpet. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. So the first thing I want to look at is the hail. Now, hail here is always used, in the Bible, hail is always a judgment. All right, uh, and there are some references, uh, but I want you to think back of the seventh plague of Egypt, and we're going to look at this a little bit later in detail, but a lot of this relates to the plagues of Egypt. So the seventh plague of Egypt, there's your scripture verses. We don't have the, the papers that, that we, I'll have, uh, I'll send them to uh, John's and see if they can't print out a copy and bring them next week. Uh, so that way you'll have these scripture references. But... Again, it's always on the website. If you need these scriptures and you don't get them, go to the website, download the notes. It's 
real easy. You just click, click a button, boom, there you go. So, hail, kalaza, that is the Greek word for hail. And it's only four times in the New Testament. Now, let's talk about this for a second. This could be literal hailstones. Or, um, hail could be seen as also something's just falling from the sky. So it may not be actual hail. Uh, you know, it could be. We don't know. John, when he's, remember, John is, is he's, he's standing in front of a big screen, basically. And he's watching these things happen. He doesn't know a lot of times what he's seeing. And so we don't know if what he is seeing and what he is being shown by the Lord is, is some kind of symbology like we see in Revelation 13. Or is it literal? He's, he, he's telling it as, as it's happening but using the terminology way back then. Exactly. He's using the terms that he's, he knows. Right. So... I'll see something. Yeah. What this could be, I'll be honest, it could be, and if we look at the later trumpets, the, the if we as we follow this in natural progression, it could be a nuclear exchange of some kind. It could be actually uh, MERVs. He could be seeing the actual warheads coming down. Because a MERV, I mean, if you don't know what it looks like, it kind of looks like a big hailstone when it and when it re-enters. Okay, uh, because the hail has fire and it's mixed with blood. And if you've ever seen something re-enter the atmosphere, it's fire and it looks like it's mixed with blood if you don't know what it is. Um, but the judgment is a third of the land, trees, and the grass. So we're going to leave it at that because, frankly, we don't know what it is. There are some speculations out there. And like I said, I've seen a lot of people spend a lot of time uh, saying that this is what it is. And, in fact, there are some post-trib believers who actually believe that some of this has already been fulfilled. And I don't see that. And so we're not going to waste our time on it. Second trumpet. Second angel blew the trumpet. Something like a great mountain burning with fire thrown into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, here we go again with the Egyptian plague. This is similar to the first Egyptian plague. The, the, the sea, the, the water becoming blood. Now, one of the speculations is if you take all the sea mass of all the oceans, the Atlantic Ocean is about a third of the sea. So we could have the entire Atlantic Ocean poisoned, or it could be a third of just the, the sea waters. We don't know. We, we really don't know. But what we do know is. A third of the sea life is destroyed. Now, we're going to get into exactly what that would mean uh, later on in this. Uh, so here's a question. Is it nuclear? Is this another nuclear missile? It, is this, uh, this could be, this could be man-made. It could be supernatural or it could be natural. We need to know that, that God uses natural things to judge mankind. In fact, if you look at the plagues of Egypt, what you will see in some of them is a natural progression. When you have this, it produces this. You know, the flies came from dead things. An abundance of dead things. And then the gnats, you know, you're around foul stuff, you get gnats. And so we get these natural progressions of, you know, maybe something starts supernatural and then the natural repercussions of that. We don't know. Uh, what is this great mountain? Uh, we have to know that just 60, 70 years ago, mankind would have had no way of interpreting this possibly as some kind of a nuclear weapon. It's a mountain of fire, burning with fire. And if you've ever seen pictures of nuclear explosions, it looks, if you don't know what that is, it looks like a mountain burning with fire. No, I'll talk about it one time. Uh, Sometimes they put us with the army and uh, up on the hill, the hole, uh, and 
we feel several thousand yards from it, and then take a 105 and just almost level it out and shoot, and it was just red all the way. You could fall it, it even bounced on the ground, and it went right in the hole and blew up, but it was red. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know. It didn't come from, you know, they didn't log it in there, right. but, you know, going to the atmosphere or whatever. It, <coughs> It was red. The, the interesting red. thing here is, is it could be man-made. This could also be like a comet or an asteroid striking the sea. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I believe those, and if, if by some of the less than 1% chance that it is a post-trib rapture and we are alive during this period of time, I think we will know what's coming. I think the Holy Spirit will give us that knowledge. So, the third trumpet. Third angel sounded. A great star fell from heaven. Now, we got to pause there because what can stars represent? We talked about this a few weeks ago. What can a star represent? Y'all are hurting my feelings. Nobody's paying attention. <laughs> or everybody's too afraid to say it. What did, remember the verses where we talked about what stars were, what stars could be. Stars like the, the heavens were shaken and the stars fell from heaven. What are the stars? Angels. Angels. De demons. It's possible that, that a great star falling from heaven, it's possible that this is when Satan is cast out of heaven. We see it in Revelation 12. Remember, we have parentheses chapters. Revelation 12 is one of those parentheses chapters where it's meant to be fit into somewhere else and we don't know where. It's possible that Revelation 12, when Satan is cast out of heaven, is this is what it is. Possible. Is it probable? I don't think so. I, I would give it less than a 50% chance, but it, it ain't zero. Again, we don't know. Um, Great star fell from heaven. It was burning with like a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers. Now, see, this is why I don't think it's Satan. I just wanted to give you get that out to you because that is some of the interpretation that it's Satan. Uh, it's the third part of the rivers upon the fountains of the waters, and the name of the star uh, star was called Wormwood, and a third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, this is the second trumpet. Uh, the second trumpet was a judgment on the sea, the salt water. The third is against fresh water. So, everything that we do as people exists around water. So, this is a real, real bad judgment. So, not only is a third of the sea life killed, a lot of our food comes from the sea. And a lot of the food for our pets comes from the sea. You know, in some form or another. Uh, everything in the sea eats something from the sea, whether it's plankton, you know, whales eating plankton or sharks eating fish. So what you would have is an absolute food chain collapse. So it's also possible that 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 pale horse and, and the black horse that maybe this is those horses going out. I don't know. Maybe that chapter 4 the, the or chapter 6 with the seals are a parenthesis. I'm not sure. Okay? But all I know is that a third of the water, all water across the, the earth, whether it's fresh or salt, is judged. So when you take away a third of the drinking water, I mean drinking water is already in prime supply in certain parts of the world. Now take away a third of it. Make it bitter. Men died of the waters. It's poisonous. Now, I believe that this could also be a nuclear exchange. And let me explain why. There's 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 one reason and this is this is the aha moment. You know, every class I try to give one aha moment. Well, this is the aha moment. The word wormhood uh, is where we get the word absinthe, which is a liquor. But wormwood is also Chernobyl in Ukrainian. You ever want to know what Chernobyl meant? It means it's, it's the Ukrainian word for wormwood. So wormwood's a poison. 
when you when you take it straight and matter of fact for most of mankind's history wormwood has been used to kill other people by putting wormwood in their food or their drink that's the reason why we have tasters you know that's why ne that's what Joseph's job was and Nehemiah's job was they were the they were the cupbearers they if somebody had put wormwood in there or whatever other poison they used they would they would go first so it's possible there were certainly other poisons and so it may be a wordplay it may just be coincidence but uh, I don't believe in coincidences and I always found it when I found this out about 30 years ago I always thought it was very coincidental that they would name a nuclear reactor Chernobyl which is wormwood which is poison that's just not one of those things that you normally would do to instill the confidence of the people <laughs> you know you'd be like naming STP the death plant you know <laughs> this is people go to die here well, who wants to go work there right so just a maybe a coincidence fourth trumpet fourth angel blew and a third part of the sun was struck a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light would be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night then I looked up and heard an angel cry with a loud voice and it flew directly overhead and said woe 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 to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets which we will talk about on the tenth that the three angels are about to blow so Looking at this in a couple of parts, all incoming light is reduced by a third. Um, compare that to the ninth plague in Egypt. Remember, ninth plague in Egypt is three days of darkness. Everybody remember that? That's the, that's the darkness. Uh, my theory on this is that this is a direct result of the first three trumpets. Um, whether or not these are actual nuclear weapons that are coming in. Everybody grew up remembering hearing about nuclear winter, right? Everybody know that, are you familiar with the phrase nuclear winter? This means yes, this means no, this means I don't know. Okay. The theory of nuclear winter is that uh, it, it, it works similarly with volcanoes. Uh, Mount Pinatubo in 1991 threw up so much ash that that ash gets up into the troposphere and it circulates and gets into the stratosphere and it circulates the earth and it blocks the incoming solar radiation now with Pinatubo that hydrogen sulfide and those particulates that were up in the upper atmosphere get spinned out over the, the, the equator first and gradually spreads what would happen is the uh, temperature goes down slightly that's the result uh, with Pinatubo, the average global temperature dropped about one Celsius for about a summer, two summers. Back in the late, oh, I'll take that back, back in the early 1800s, back in 1815 and 1816, I want to say, it's give or take five years, there was something called the year without a summer. And it was directly rela related to Mount Tambora erupting. And Mount Tambora was a super volcano. Mm -hmm. And it threw so much ash into the atmosphere that the temperatures across the globe plummeted about four or five degrees Celsius. Just one volcanic re uh, eruption. And the light from that was not a third of the light. It was, you know, probably about maybe two or three percent of the light. And that's how much an impact, just reducing the amount of solar insulation and solar radiation just a little bit can impact you. So much so that Boston got, I believe, 12 or 13 inches of snow in June. Crops died all across the northern hemisphere um, because of this one volcanic eruption. So what I think we're seeing here is judgment upon judgment upon judgment, and I think it probably occurs very quickly. I don't think there's a big gap. And it might actually take it place all at the same time. Yeah. I think it takes place all at the same time. And as a meteorologist, now, could this be supernatural? Yes, it could be. But again, I think looking at the previous three trumpets 
and thinking as a meteorologist of what would happen with fire moving through the atmosphere and all these things being burned up, a third of the trees, how much, how much uh, smoke would be produced by a third of the trees and a third of the grass being burned all at once? I mean, think about the amount of smoke that is produced just by a big forest fire in California. Now, a third of everything is burned. A third of the ships are destroyed, which means they're probably burning and smoking because a lot of the, oil, the traffic is cargo and oil, a lot of the seagoing vessels. So you're going to have a not only the, the things that are coming into the atmosphere, whether they're nuclear weapons or, or comets or whatever, but you're also going to have the resulting fires, and that is called a nuclear winter. When you reduce the amount of incoming light by a third, you're plunging this planet into, you do not, you will never have to worry about global warming in your lifetime. Right. Trust me. <laughs> this global warming would be, a, they're going to be wanting to crank up the SUVs because this would be devastating. And it takes years for that stuff to get out. Uh, if you go with the dinosaur theory, what killed the dinosaurs according to the theory? What was it? The cold. Because there was a, a giant comet that hit off the coast of the Yucatan. And it wasn't the actual comet blast that they say killed the dinosaurs. Now, I have a different theory about that than the, than the evolutionists. I do believe there were dinosaurs, but we're not going to get into that today. Uh, but it was the resulting cloud cover from the smoke and the fires and the actual eject, what we call ejecta, that was being thrown up into the atmosphere that actually blocked out enough of the sun to kill pretty much everything on the earth, except for some little bitty mammals. All right? So, it can be supernatural or natural. Now, this is the interesting part. I looked and heard an eagle crying with a loud voice. It flew directly overhead. Whoa, whoa, whoa. To those who dwell on the earth. Now, what the eagle is saying is, you know what? You haven't seen anything yet. What's about to happen is a lot worse than that. Now, you want to think about a third of everything dying, but yet, this is going to be worse. So the final three trumpets are three woes. So let's look at this, these, four first, these first four trumpets. It, the first trumpet's aimed at the earth. Second trumpet's aimed at the sea. The third trumpet's aimed at the waters. And the fourth trumpet is aimed at the sun, moon, and stars. These are the judgment of thirds. So basically everything, and I believe it probably happens all at once. It just seems logical to me that it's a third of everything. Okay. Now, we go back now and look at the, the seal judgments and the third that's mentioned there. So it's possible that those seals are actually being un, unfolded here. I'm not sure how it all works out. Uh, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, to be honest. Uh, I would imagine that this is where most people who get dogmatic are going to get tripped up is when they get dogmatic about what prophecy means. And they're, they're, <laughs> we, know we just know it's going to happen. What order it's going to take place, it's going to be revealed in, in the time that God wants it revealed. I don't believe these things will be silent. And it may be that the people then will be able to look back and go, see this, this is what happened. This was written 3,000, 2,000 years ago, however long it is. So there's your judgments. And I, as I said, I believe this fourth trumpet is a result of these first three. It makes sense to me. So, in closing, I want to take a look at Exodus versus Revelation. All right? And this is where you're going to get, need to get these notes. Because uh, you're probably not going to be able to write it all down. So, if you remember the book of Exodus and, and the Exodus story, and you compare it to Revelation, what you're going to do is you're going to find that there's a lot of similarities. And there's probably more than you've thought of. Now, we've seen three, but let's look at it. So, Jacob's trouble. 
This is the time of Jacob's trouble, remember? This, the great tribulation period is the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, the Exodus period was also a time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? They cry to God. Remember the, the what did God tell Moses? That cry, your people are crying out to me. Well, isn't this what we just studied in Revelation 6? Those martyrs, those souls under the altar, they're crying out to God, and they're heard. See, in verse 11, they're heard. Yeah, I, I hear you. Wait a little longer. That was the answer. All right? The children of Israel were heard. Their cries were heard. And God sent them a deliverer. Uh, he will command the oppressors to let them go. All right? There's two witnesses with miracles. Moses and Aaron. And then we have two witnesses in Revelation 11. Enemies will also perform miracles. Okay, real quick, this goes back about probably two months. Who are the, in Jewish folklore, who are, what are the name of the two guys that opposed Moses and Aaron? Come on, come on. Make, make me proud. Like, uh, Jonas? Johns and Jonas. Okay. Jonas and Jonas. All right, that. We know that out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Just as Jonathan and opposed Moses, so will these also oppose. So we have enemies that are going to perform miracles. This is the Antichrist and the false prophet specifically. There's sore judgments from God. Hey, brother. Uh, God sends sores. He sent sores upon the Egyptians, and He's going to send sores here. God is going to supernaturally protect His people. He sealed, remember, the 144,000 were sealed, that they could not be hurt. Well, what sealed, the, what, what protected God's people in the Exodus period? I would say the Passover was the blood. The Passover, the blood. They were, you had that seal on your door, made of blood, of a lamb. You were supernaturally protected, and the angel of death did not visit you. Water turned to blood. Water's turned to blood in Exodus. You got water turned to blood here. There's satanic frogs. Remember, there are frogs, the, the plague of frogs in Egypt. Well, in Revelation 16, we see frogs. They're demonic. There's locusts. Egypt, here. Boils and pains. Remember, one of the plagues of Egypt was they were stricken with boils. Well, we get that again in Revelation 16. Hailstones. We just talked about the hailstones. That was seventh plague. Darkness. So we got a third of the, of the light in the fourth trumpet, but here we've got darkness in Revelation 16, and we have the three days of darkness. Hearts are hardened. What did God do to Pharaoh's heart? He hardened his heart. And again, we read it several times, not just in these verses, but even before. They would not repent. They, they would go into the caves and, and seek death. But they wouldn't repent. Death to multitudes. People just are dying left and right. Israel to be delivered. Yes, sir. That is why since 67... Well, you know what's even more interesting than that is there are a lot of supernatural stories of things that have happened during the Yom Kippur War, the Six Day War. Uh, there's a story out there of a um, of the Egyptians in the Sinai Peninsula when they were about to overtake an Israeli battalion or something that the Egyptians saw like a giant hand. <laughs> This is documented stuff. There's all sorts of stuff in there. I have to look up and see if I, I've got, got it somewhere. 
but the Egyptians saw a giant hand, and it scared them so much that they turned around and ran. They dropped their weapons. Where it, it reminds you of what you read in the book of Kings. Uh, 1 Kings chapter uh, 20 through 22, and even on into 2 Kings where they, you know, they heard a rumor and they, they saw these things and it scared them so much that they, they, they took off and ran. Like I said before, the Bible tells us that Michael says I fight for the children of Israel. That's right. Yeah. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. So I know there's probably uh, certainly more questions than answers about these first four trumpets. I think the key thing to remember here is that they're all linked. And whether or not they're supernatural or natural or man-made, they're, they're somehow all linked and they probably all occur at the same time. Um, and if they don't occur at the same time, there's a very short interval. We don't know. But to me, it's probably simultaneous. Uh, Have you looked at what, how the world would be separated into thirds? Mm -hmm. we, we talked about that uh, when we, uh, back in uh, several weeks ago. Um, the interesting thing is about, you know, the land mass of the earth, if you take away Antarctica, mm -hmm is a quarter of the world um, so it's going to be one of the it's one of those things uh, but here the interesting thing is from that when we when dealing with the seals is it just says the earth and we don't know if that meant land or the whole thing here we know a third of the, it's a third of the land do you think what the u.s would be easier to separate into thirds you know i don't i don't know I don't know. Maybe that's a project. That's can, speculation. Yeah, it's spec. Yeah, we, we. That's what we said at the very beginning. We're not going to speculate because we don't. We frankly do not know. Um, and and that's the lesson, I guess, of all of this. Uh, and the reason what we said at the very beginning was we're going to be going through these last part pretty quickly because it is all speculation. And to sit there and pontificate and to theorize on stuff that you really it's it's kind of hopeless it's a it's a fun thing to do in your own time to sharpen your own iron but as she said it is pointless except for the except for this what you learn while you study because as we you know we can go back and, and look at you know we got all these other scripture references as if you can us uh, backing up the scripture, it's just speculation. Where? No, I just said. Oh yeah, yeah. You can't back it. Right, right, right. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, and it is, and we can. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is if you. I guess another good lesson here is the it's continuity of. Bad. Well, it's the continuity of scripture. You know, before today, I'll ask you to be honest. How many of you had actually thought about the 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 similarities between the, the plagues of Egypt and what you see in Revelation. How many of you have actually sat there and thought about that? So, so a couple of you, three of you, four of you. So what you see there is another instance where all of Scripture is linked. And above all, this gives you the confidence that even though it's separated by 1,500 years at this point, with men that, that didn't even know each other, one knew of one and one didn't know of the other and they're separated across time and, and different empires and empires had risen and fallen but the message is the same. The message is the same. And we can have confidence in that. Okay?